should say recording. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sharks for Kids webinar in August. Um, this is going to be Sawfish Science. Um, just to give you all a little bit of background about Sharks for Kids, we're an educational platform uh, created to spark a new generation of shark advocates through access to a range of educational materials, all available on our website at sharksforkids.com. We have a lot of material available for teachers, for curriculum, for uh, student activities, as well as for the students or individuals. If you are just interested in sharks, there's a lot of stuff on there. It says for students, um, or it says education and outreach. There's a few of those tabs that are available for you. Um, we, you'll also see a webinar tab where you can see um, our previous, uh, previously recorded webinars, as well as our upcoming uh, schedule for um, the August series and then those going forward. Uh, so today um, we're doing uh, sawfish science. We have the Jossum, Dr. Dean Grubbs uh, here today that will speak with us. He is a full faculty researcher as well as the director of research at Florida State University Coastal Marine Lab and an expert soft on sawfish research in the Western Atlantic, particularly for the small tooth sawfish. Um, very excited to learn about the biology, ecology, and conservation of sawfish today. Um, before I go ahead and give Dean the floor, I just want to let you know there should be an area down below in your Zoom where you can put in questions, um, like a kind of a Q&A within the chat. I will try to answer some of those questions uh, during the talk, but also after the talk, I'll address some uh, with whatever time we have left uh, when Dr. Grubbs is finished and we'll have him answer them. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and give uh, Dean the floor and you can go ahead and share your screen. We'll make sure you, we can hear you, okay. Okay, thanks, thanks, Annie. Before, before I share my screen, I'm just gonna point out uh, sort of the subject matter of what we're talking about today. So this is, um, this is a small tooth sawfish rostrum. And so when I gave one of these uh, webinars a few couple months ago, we talked about deep sea sharks. Um, and so now we're gonna talk about something completely different. And so this is the rostrum, basically the front of the snout off of a sawfish. And if you don't know what a sawfish is, you're gonna find out very quickly. Uh, but what I wanna point out to you is that this illustrates the main conservation concern for sawfish. You can see this netting all wrapped around this sawfish. That's what killed this sawfish, basically, is being wrapped in a, in a net. And so um, uh, this is one from Florida. It was killed in a gill net. And so, um, and so that gives you an idea of what a rostrum looks like. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and, uh, and we'll start the, start the presentation. Okay, can you see it, Annie? Yes, I can see it just fine. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Annie, for the introduction. And so we're going to talk today about um, is there any hope for sawfish for uh, our arguably our most endangered marine predator? And so just as a reminder for those who weren't didn't tune into my previous webinar where I'm located, this is the state of Florida, and this is where my marine lab is located. And so from that lab, I do research on a lot of different fishes, but mostly sharks and rays more than anything else. And so I typically do work on the biology, ecology, and conservation of both coastal and deep sea sharks and rays. Um, and it's not just studying the big things like this sawfish and tiger shark and six gill shark, but also a lot of the smaller species that you might not be as familiar with. And so my work is primarily in, in, the, in Florida, off Florida and in adjacent areas. So we do a lot of deep sea work in the Bahamas and in the Gulf of Mexico. We just uh, completed our yearly coastal shark survey along the Big Bend of Florida, where we, we tag about a thousand sharks a year in that survey. Um, and then we do work on sawfish down in South Florida down here and in the Bahamas. And so that's what I'm gonna to talk to you today about is our, our small tooth sawfish work. Now, if you remember, um, I asked the question in my um, in the previous webinar about how many kinds of sharks there were and what sharks people are most familiar with. And most people are surprised to hear how many species of sharks there are and also 
to learn that the sharks that they're most familiar with are decidedly not typical sharks. Things like the white shark and the bull shark and the great hammerhead, tiger shark, whale shark. Those are decidedly atypical sharks, even though they're the ones that get most of the, uh, most of the attention. There are actually about 540 species of sharks and most of them are small, small animals, less than three feet long that live their whole lives in the deep sea. So a typical shark is a little brown shark in the deep sea. But there's another big group out there. And so in Florida alone, we have about, oh, 60 plus species of sharks in both coastal and deep sea areas. But then there's this other group, the batoids. So these are the stingrays and their relatives. And we have another 40 or so species of stingrays and their relatives uh, in, in Florida. And if you put those together, uh, there's uh, about 1,250 living species of sharks and rays in the world and, and, some, and over 100 that live in Florida and the Bahamas. And so um, why am I putting these things together? Um, aren't stingrays different from sharks? Well, not so much. We, we like to commonly refer to uh, the stingrays and their relatives as flat sharks or pancake sharks. Uh, because they're very closely related. Essentially, the only differences between a ray and a shark is if you flip a ray like this cow nose ray on its back, you'll see the gills are underneath, they're on the bottom. So the pectoral fins are fused to its head over the gills. So the gills are on the bottom. Here's a typical shark, a reef shark, Caribbean reef shark, and you see the gills are on the sides. Uh, that's the main difference. In addition, if you look, this is a, as a CT scan of a, of a stingray. And, you, and right in front of the, the backbone there, the vertebrae, there's a big group of fused vertebrae. That thing's called a synarchual, but only the batoids have that. The sharks, this is a lemon shark CT scan, does not have these fused vertebrae. Those are about the only two differences between them. So the rays are basically pancake sharks. Um, so what about sawfishes? So sawfishes are a small family of very large rays. Now superficially, this critter looks more like a shark, right, than a ray. It's got two big dorsal fins, got a tail and everything. It's not ex extremely flat like you think of a stingray. Well, they are rays, and I'll show you that in a second. There are only five species in the world living, one that lives in the U.S. in the Bahamas, that's the small tooth sawfish, which is the one we're gonna talk about today. They're all very large animals. The um, uh, four of the five species in the world get 16 feet long or bigger, so they get quite large. Even the smallest of them, the one that doesn't get that big, still gets 10 feet long, and we call it a dwarf sawfish. That's pretty big for a dwarf, I think. Um, so they're big animals. So why do I say they're rays? Well, this lemon shark is obviously a shark. It's got its gill slits on the side. And this stingray is obviously, the southern stingray is obviously a ray, and it's flat, and it's got its gills are underneath. You can't see them there. Well, this is a small tooth sawfish here. And if I take it and I flip it upside down, there are its gill slits right on the bottom there. So its pectoral fins are fused to its head over its gill arches. And so there are the gill slits. So it is a type of, of ray. So like I said, there's only one species in the, in the US and the Bahamas. The sawfish are the only living group of rays that have a toothed rostrum. Now you may have heard of saw sharks, so sharks are a small group of slightly deeper water sharks. So the gills are on the side that also have a toothed rostrum, but it's, it's shaped very differently and it functioned very differently than a saw fish. Um, this rostrum is used for killing their prey, also for the de defending themselves. You saw at the beginning of that video, this sawfish shaking its rostrum vigorously. They will try to defend themselves. The ones we catch, they, there are holes on the side of my boat from them hitting the side of the boat with that, with that rostrum. Um, underneath the rostrum, there are receptors that detect electricity, very minute fields of electricity. You may have heard about that with sharks. Rays have this as well. Every living creature produces an electrical field, a very weak bioelectrical field. You do sitting in a chair, wherever you are right now, you're producing electricity. That very weak electrical field can be detected by this rostrum like a big metal detector and allows them to find prey on the bottom. Um, but these are major predators in uh, marine environments, these sawfish are. So this is the sawfish rostrum here and sitting on the tooth there is a big red drum or redfish scale. And so this sawfish has whacked a 
redfish and eating it, presumably. Over here on the left, that's actually the tail of a sh sharp nose shark hanging out of the mouth of a sawfish. The sawfish ate and swallowed an entire three foot long shark. Um, so these things are major predators in the, in the areas where they live, just like large sharks are. Um, this is a black nose shark we caught that clearly has been hit in the side by the teeth of a, of a sawfish. Um, and here is me actually pulling a three foot shark out of the mouth of a sawfish that we caught down in the Florida Keys. So these are major predators. They essentially fill a, a similar part of the food chain as a bull shark does in, uh, in, in the areas where they, they inhabit. Now, unfortunately, all five species of sawfish around the world are endangered. They're either listed as critically endangered or endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the shark specialist group, which I'm a, a, a member of. Uh, we assess the threat status of all the living sharks and rays. And uh, all of these are listed as critically endangered or endangered. Our species, the small tooth sawfish, is listed as critically endangered. The reason it's critically endangered in part is because of targeted commercial fishing. They haven't been targeted for commercial fishing in the United States or in adjacent areas in many decades since the, the uh, at least the 1930s or 40s, but that did cause uh, drastic declines in their populations. These are photos from the Florida Keys from the 1920s. Um, bycatch mortality, getting tangled in nets, like I showed you in the beginning, is a major source of mortality, whether you're talking about gill nets, or our trawls, this is a shrimp trawl net here in Florida. Uh, we think that bycatch in shrimp trawls, in, in, um, primarily in Florida, is the major source of, of mortality on sawfish today. And then of course, sport fishing also became vogue in the 30s, 40s through the 70s to just catch big sharks and sawfish and things and just take your picture with them. The rostrum was often cut off of them and hung on you know on someone's wall, and then the the dead animal uh, thrown overboard. And so this these lower two photos are in the Florida Keys, um, and it, when it became very popular for tourists to come down, catch a big sawfish, get their picture taken with this big dead animal, and then throw the rest overboard and just take the rostrum. In fact, this is a rostrum that's over four feet long that I have in my office that was donated to me. Uh, by the grandson of a man who caught this sawfish in the Indian River Lagoon in 1872. So you're, you're talking, um, you know, almost 150 years ago that this was caught in Florida. And so this was a big sawfish. So this has been going on for a long time. And then the last source of uh, their population decline is habitat loss. If you've ever heard anything about mangroves and the animals, how important mangroves are to different fishes, particularly as nursery habitat for protection, mangroves, particularly red mangroves, which is what you see right up here above this little baby sawfish I'm holding, um, are critical to the survival of young sawfish. Um, so the only places that we know, so, so small tooth sawfish historically were on, in the uh, Western Atlantic and the Eastern Atlantic, distributed from the United States down to Brazil in the Western Atlantic and then uh, off the coast of, of Africa, uh, much of the uh, subtropical to tropical coasts of Africa. They're mostly um, gone from most of the countries where they once existed. The only places that we know there may be viable populations seem to be Florida is by far the largest population of small tooth sawfish followed by the Bahamas and perhaps Cuba. And I'll touch on that in a little bit. So because Florida has the largest population, the United States does, there have been a number of conservation actions that um, to, to protect them and promote their recovery, which is probably why we do have sawfish today. Uh, sawfish have been protected in the state of Florida since 1992. Since 1996, all sawfish have been listed as endangered or critically endangered by that shark specialist group of the IUCN. And then in 2003, the small tooth sawfish actually became the first saltwater fish ever listed under the U.S. Endangered Species Act as endangered. And so it's been protected by endangered status in the, uh, in the United States federally since 2003. The IUCN uh, periodically publishes a global 
conservation strategy. So what do we need to do in order to promote recovery of, of uh, sawfish around the world? All of the species, you can download the recovery plans at this website. Um, last year, we are two years ago now, we, we published a progress and priorities document. And, and in that, what it, the, the big priorities were to one, encourage protection of sawfish in countries where there are none, like the Bahamas, for example, where there are no protections for sawfish. And also we had research priorities, which include figuring out what is the most important habitat for juvenile sawfish, large, larger sawfish, as well as adult sawfish. Where do they mate? Where do they uh, aggregate? Where are the main feeding grounds? What habitats do we need to protect in order to promote uh, their recovery? And we also need to know basic biology of the sawfish, like how big are they when they get to be adults? How long does it take them to get to be adults? How often do they reproduce? And how many babies do they produce? Those kinds of things. Those are all questions that we just don't have uh, answers to right now. Um, Critical habitat was designated in Florida in 2012 and well, originally in 2009 and essentially includes all of the known nursery habitat for sawfish, so where babies are born. And so this includes the Charlotte Harbor, Caloosahatchee River area, which is a highly developed, human developed area, as well as the 10,000 Islands in Everglades National Park, which is a relatively pristine area. And so we've done a lot of work in, in these areas, me and my colleagues and my students, colleagues from NOAA, colleagues from the state agencies, looking at sawfish in these areas. Uh, we've done active tracking where we put transmitters on them and just follow them around, listening to them to see what their habitat use patterns are. We've also done passive tracking of the babies in these nurseries where we basically tag them and put out a series of these receivers and every time a, a sawfish passes within a couple hundred yards of these receivers, it gets logged that sawfish number whatever, 12, went by this receiver at this time and date. Um, and so we had receivers spread out throughout the, the area, but we also actively tracked them. This is one of my former students, Lisa Hollandseed, tracking uh, baby sawfish from a kayak in the Everglades National Park. And this is just the area that this saw, one sawfish used. You can see it's a pretty small area. It's essentially, if you took five soccer fields and, and stacked them up against each other, that's about the area that a baby sawfish uses. Uh, so it's a pretty small area that they're, that they're using. Um, and so that shows you that it's critical to preserve these habitats. Uh, that, that they need because they don't move around much. And the reason they're in these habitats, and so this is, this is primary sawfish, red mangrove habitat. This is a gill net set by my NOAA colleagues. And you can see that uh, there's a baby sawfish coming into that uh, net right there. At high tide, they'll often go up into these mangroves to hide. And then at low tide, they'll go into these little pools that left. Um, after most of the larger sharks that might be predators move out. And so this is a, a drone image that Michael Scholl took of, of uh, there's a baby sawfish right there. And uh, you can see this is primary mangrove habitat, but it's low tide. So this sawfish can't get up into those roots right now. And so it's basically cruising the edges as shallow as it can possibly go, often with its dorsal fins out of the water. Why does it do that? Well, it's avoiding predators. And so this is a bull shark. It was caught by an angler in the Everglades, and that in, in its mouth is a sawfish rostrum. So it's basically swallowed a baby sawfish whole. So, pre, so for the babies, getting, caught, getting eaten by predators, primarily sharks, is a major issue. But we're really interested in how in, in the habitats of adult sawfish. And so how do we catch the adult sawfish? And so this shows uh, what we do to catch the adult sawfish. We set out lines. Uh, throughout the Key, Florida Keys, Everglades National Park, and uh, we leave them out only for one hour. They're baited hooks, essentially a small version of what a, a uh, commercial fisherman might use. We leave those lines out for, for essentially one hour, and then we haul them back in and we tag and release all the sharks, and then we try to catch a sawfish. And so here's a big adult sawfish in Everglades National Park. You can see they're incredibly strong animals. And so the first thing we do is try to get the animal under control. 
And so we, you see that one just hit me in the side of the face, almost ended my career. Um, and so we try to get the rostrum under control, the tail under control, and we get them alongside the boat. They're very, very tough animals because they're like stingrays. They can just lay on the bottom and breathe. So they're not like the shark, many sharks where they don't have to swim to breathe. And so once we have them under control, we count the teeth, we take photos of the rostrum, we'll put tags on them. Uh, for this one, I'm putting a satellite tag on the animal through its dorsal fin. You notice I put a hole through its dorsal fin, but it didn't move at all because there's no nerve endings or anything in that dorsal fin, so it doesn't, they don't even feel that. Um, and then we'll also take blood, and uh, we take blood to allow us to see what the reproductive status is. Is the animal a mature animal, mature male, mature female? Is it reproducing right now? Is it pregnant? Uh, we can get all of that from that from that blood. And then once we get the blood samples and the genetic samples and things, we tag the animal and let it go. And you here you can see the animal. This is one we've just tagged and released. This is in the deeper water off the Florida Keys, edge of the Florida Keys. And you can see they just swim right back down to the bottom, uh, no worse for wear, because they're pretty, pretty tough, uh, tough animals. So over the last 10 years, we've done over 600 of those sets throughout South, uh, Southwest Florida and the Florida Keys. We've caught 64 adult sawfish, more than almost 20, over 2,400 sharks, um, but 64 large sawfish in these areas. We catch them in two main habitats, either in the northern part of Florida Bay, where it's very, very murky, dark water. And this is dominated by adult males, but we do catch a few females as well. This is also the primary habitat for this critter. And so if anybody recognizes that, that is not an alligator. That's a crocodile. That's an American crocodile, which is a major um, uh, conservation success story because it was listed as endangered. And now it's been uh, downlisted from being endangered because the population has recovered. There are also only found in the United States are only found in Southwest Florida in the same kind of areas where the sawfish are. And so often we have to get in the water to, uh, to work up the big sawfish. And here you can see I'm taking blood from the big sawfish. You can imagine a big crocodile swimming around in the water out there that we're always sort of got your head on a swivel looking for, for a croc, although we've never had any issues with the crocodiles at all. Uh, unlike my colleagues at study of uh, sawfish in Australia, much bigger issue there than what we, we have to deal with. The other place we catch them is uh, in the Florida Keys, particularly right along the edge of the continental shelf. This is where, um, this is basically the old uh, shoreline during the last, um, between the ice ages, uh, during the last ice age. And so it gets quite deep there. And so water depths of about 150 to 200 feet deep is where we catch uh, large ones. And this is the main area where we catch both adult females and males together in this deeper water. Um, and it's usually in areas where you've got a lot of current flow through the Florida Keys, through breaks in the Keys. And so you get a lot of nutrients coming in from Florida Bay. Um, and so we've started implanting transmitters in these animals. Uh, we still use the satellite tags some, but mostly now we're putting transmitters inside of the animals and it's just it's a, a transmitter about the size of your finger. We make a tiny little incision and then suture it shut with a couple of, of, of sutures, a couple of stitches. And now that and the tags last for 10 years. And so anytime that animal for 10 years of its life swims in front of one of those receivers, um, we'll get data on it hopefully. And so, for example, this is the array of receivers that we had up in Everglades National Park. And so if any of our sawfish go by one of these receivers, we're going to know about it. But the cool thing is that it's not just our receivers. Anybody's receivers will pick up our sawfish. And so um, we have these, there are these big collaborative receiver arrays, big collaborative groups of researchers, of scientists, from all different institutions, state and federal governments, as well as colleges and universities that have these receivers. And so we have thousands of them throughout the Gulf of Mexico and up the Atlantic coast of Florida, as well as on up the Atlantic coast. Um, and so we share data. Anytime I pick up somebody else's um, animals on my receivers, I let them know. And hopefully whenever they pick up my sawfish on theirs, they let, they, um, they let me know too. 
And if any of you on Tuesday were chiming into the webinar that was given by Jasmine Graham, uh, Jasmine is, is my, uh, was my master's student. And so a lot of the, the initial um, acoustic tracking work that we did using these methods went into Jasmine's thesis, which she, she defended just this past uh, spring. And so we've been really fortunate that we've actually had the sawfish that we've caught down in the South, in the Florida Keys and the Florida Bay have been detected on more than 500 receivers as far north as Georgia, as well as as, as far north as right off my, the Marine Lab. Some of our own receivers right here have picked up sawfish we tagged way down in the Florida Keys. So it's amazing the kind of um, information you can get from this. And so just to sort of illustrate that, because we're still in the early stages of, of analyzing all these data, because we have about 50 sawfish tagged with these tags, and these tags will be giving us data for 10 years. So we're going to learn so much about the movements and biology of these sawfish. But I just wanted to give you one example of the kind of data we're getting. This is a big male, this guy here, that was caught on a wreck right down here on April 1st, 2017, and uh, in the Florida Keys. This guy, three weeks after we tagged it, was up off Cape Canaveral. It stayed up there for, for about two weeks, and then, then three weeks later, it was down in the lower Florida Keys. Then it decided, by September, it went up off of Tampa and, and got detected on a receiver. Didn't like Tampa too much, apparently, because by November, it came back down to the lower Florida Keys. It messed around down there in, during the winter and spring months in the Florida Keys, and then all of a sudden, boom, the exact same day of the year that it appeared at Cape Canaveral in 2017, it was back there in 2018 in the same receivers. Then it came back down uh, and was down in the, in the winter of 2018, following winter of 2018, 2019, it was back down in South, in the lower Florida Keys. And then almost the same day in April in 2019, it was back up on the same receivers off Cape Canaveral. So some really cool data we were able to get of these animals moving back and forth and figure out where the really important habitats for these animals lie. And so we're trying to figure out not only where are the important habitats for the animals, but also where are they most likely to get captured in commercial fisheries that might cause death, might cause mortality, in the hopes that we can inform fisheries managers of ways that we can um, mitigate or, or eliminate that, that mortality. Now notice that animal only got detected on receivers in Florida. There are receivers in the Bahamas too. And so one of our big questions all along has been, do sawfish from Florida go to the Bahamas and do ones from the Bahamas go to Florida? And so we started doing work in the Bahamas about 10 years ago as well. These are the locations where we have records of sawfish in the Bahamas. It's primarily in, on the island of Andros and the island of Bimini mostly. And so for the last 10 years, we've been basically trailering my little boat all the way down to Miami, and then we take it and go across to Bimini and then to Andros. Uh, often we, we uh, partner with the field, uh, the field school and, you, and use the Garvin as the, uh, their boat as our sort of our mothership. Um, and so then we'll look for sawfish along that coastline. This is a little video from the very first time we ever went to the Bahamas uh, to look for sawfish. Uh, this was part of a National Geographic documentary. We didn't have um, our long lines to set at that time, so we were just looking for them by visual sight and then um, try and catch them in a, in a dip net uh, or with a, a small uh, rostrum snare, um, which we, we were successful at catching and tagging two during that first trip. Um, did the same exact kind of work up on them and everything and then released them with satellite tags on them initially, now with the same kind of acoustic transmitters, trying to figure out whether they um, stay in the Bahamas or go, go to, the, to the United States. Because one of the big questions we had is, are they giving birth in the Bahamas? Because when we started this work, the only place it was ever known that sawfish gave birth in the Western Atlantic is in Florida. Um, and so all the big ones that we catch, the big females, we'll use an ultrasound and the blood to figure out whether they're pregnant or not. So this is an ultrasound. It's my colleague, Jim Gelslider from University of North Florida. And we're ultrasounding this female to see if we can see any babies inside. 
but we had never known that there were any small newborns in, in the Bahamas and no pregnant ones had ever been caught. Well, our biggest, coolest thing to happen to us was in 2016, in December, the end of 2016. And this is in the Bahamas, in Andros. And we caught this uh, large female, the biggest sawfish we'd ever caught in the Bahamas. She was about 15 feet long, uh, so, so quite large. Um, she actually had a tag in her, but there was no information on the tag. So we couldn't figure out where she had been tagged. Since I'm one of the few people tagging sawfish, our first thought was we probably tagged this animal in Florida and she surrounded the Bahamas, but we didn't know that. Um, so there's my student, former student Bianca Prohaska. She's getting blood so that we can look at her reproductive status as well as look at her physiological stress. Once she has blood, we will move her over uh, on her back to, uh, to put the transmitter in it. And we noticed that there's uh, something moving around in there. And this is video taken by Jake Jerome, by the way, from, uh, from the field school. Um, and so we noticed that there were baby sawfish trying to be born. They're trying to get out of the female. And there were two trying to get out at the same time. And so we just, I decided to play midwife and try to uh, and, and help, help them be born so that they didn't try to injure themselves with both trying to get out at the same time. Um, you see they're fully formed little versions of their mom. Um, they use a yolk sac attached to their digestive tract for nutrition during development when they're in the mom. These didn't have any of that yolk sac left, which tells us they were ready to be born. And so this mom was in very, very shallow water, as you can see, uh, in there to give birth. Notice there's a little sheath around the teeth here that protects those teeth when they're being born so that they don't break off and also presumably the teeth to uh, protect the mother during that stage as well. Um, we did put little pit tags in the, in the babies. So these are the same sort of microchips you put in your dog or your cat. And so we can use that to, um, if we ever catch them again. Um, notice we pulled three out of mom and she just knocked my colleague Andrew Crutch from Noah over that was mom giving birth to two more on her own. She basically arched her, her side and squeezed out two babies at once. And, uh, and so we had five of them came out. One of them got away initially, but you'll see it come swimming by here. Uh, there it comes swimming back. And, uh, and so my former student, Brian Keller, actually just was able to grab it and they, they, and they hand it to, to Jake. Uh, Nick and Jake take care of that. And then we tagged all these animals um, and let them go. Um, there's footage here of, of one of the ones we're releasing that, that Jake took with his GoPro. And you'll see, this is the first footage ever of a newborn sawfish underwater. And you'll see it's kind of awkward, uh, as you might imagine with that big thing in front of its head, hedge trimmer on the front of its, its head. But it swims off and, and in about 30 seconds, it, it actually figures out how to swim and, and goes on along its way. So that was our first proof, and now we have more proof that actually sawfish do um, are born in in um, in the Bahamas. Now I mentioned that that mom was had a tag in it. It turns out that that tag came from when she was actually tagged uh, in 2002, almost 15 years earlier in Bimini, and so. Um, um, so this is just uh, quickly, this is where we caught her. And so this shows you that the habitat for the babies there is much, much different than what we see in, the, in, the, in Florida. Um, very beautiful habitat, but very different. So the mom was originally actually tagged up here in 2002 in a genetic sample. There's the, using the genetics is how we were able to tell it was the same animal. Um, and then we caught her almost 15 years later in Andros. Her satellite tag popped off right here, and then she actually went back to Bimini in September 2017. Then back to, to Andros in 2018, back to Bimini in, in April of 2018, back to Bimini in February 2019. So sort of the same pattern as what we saw in Florida. So this is evidence that the sawfish in the Bahamas are staying in the Bahamas. We don't think they're going to Florida. We don't think any of the ones in Florida are coming to the Bahamas. So that suggests we've got at least two populations that we need to protect and monitor to promote recovery of the species. And so it appears that there's no exchange between these two countries. Um, 
And so this is on the Great Bahama Bank here. But notice there's another area of the Bahamas up here, the Little Bahama Bank, that is separated from the Great Bahama Bank by very deep water, as deep as the water. This water between Florida and the Bahamas is about 2,500 feet deep, very deep, over 2,000 feet deep. It's the same between these two areas. So there could be another population up there. And so um, we just scratched the surface to start looking in the Little Bahama Bank up there. We got some data from some uh, fishermen and, and with any is actually part of this project. Um, and we got some data of small juveniles on the Little Bahama Bank. We actually went there last year and this is actually a drone image that any um, took of us catching a sawfish, the first one ever tagged on the Little Bahama Bank. So it may be that there are two separate populations in the Bahamas with the one on the Little Bahama Bank being very, very small. And of course, this was in the Abaco Marls and on the Little Bahama Bank, of course, is the area that was devastated by Hurricane Dorian last year. Um, and so a lot of the habitat for both animals and humans was, was destroyed. Um, so just in closing it down now, uh, we know that there are po separate populations in Florida and the Bahamas, perhaps two populations in the Bahamas. Our next step is to start doing work in Cuba. And so we've been working with, local, with Cuban researchers and we are documenting that there are new cases, there are, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, contemporary sawfish records in Cuba. Um, the conclusion so far is that we have very strong evidence that in Florida, the population is recovering. In the Bahamas, we have no idea what the population is doing yet, but there's no protections for sawfish in the Bahamas, unlike in Florida where they're completely protected. In Cuba, they are protected, unlike the Bahamas, but their status is unknown. And so we need to start monitoring all three of these populations to try to figure out whether this species can recover and have a robust, popu uh, robust populations. Um, but Florida is giving us a really positive sign that we are seeing recovery of this, of this species, one of, our, one of, if not our most endangered uh, species of, of uh, shark or ray. And so thanks for listening to this. Before I go, the last thing is I have to give you a little promotion for my shark book. It just, it's shipping like right now. You can order them online from Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Johns Hopkins Press. That's where it was published. And so if you want to learn more about sharks and rays and their biology, um, check, out, check out this book that just came out. And um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to any if I can figure out how to do that. Stop share. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dean. That was so much information. I really enjoyed it um, and quite some adventures as well. <laughs> some yeah. field tours. You know very well about the adventures. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. I've had a little, little snapshot of that experience. Um, so we do have um, we do have a question in our little Q and A that I'll uh, uh, shout out, and then um, for other participants, it's still open right now. If you want to start um, putting in those questions, uh, and I'll try to get to them. Um, so Nora is curious, uh, and this was before uh, your talk started, uh, how do sawfish actually eat their prey? And so um, while you did mention the rostrum quite a bit, and you showed a lot of those pictures with those teeth, I was wondering if there's other ways they eat or are they very dependent on that rostrum? Yeah, we, we think they're very de dependent on that rostrum for killing their prey. So it's an interesting question because if you look at their teeth, I can put my hand down the mouth of a sawfish and not worry about it at all. But they can't bite very hard. They have teeth that look more like those of a stingray. They don't have teeth that look like a shark. So they're not pointed or cusped. So they can't cut you or anything or cut their prey. And so when we first started doing this work, we thought they probably eat a lot of invertebrates, a lot of crabs and shrimp and things like that, that they would just crush up with those teeth. Um, but it turns out they just don't really use those teeth that much for uh, eating their prey, for handling their prey. They, they are eating fish they're, and they eat fish all the way from, babe, from when they're juveniles to adults. We, we thought they might even use the rostrum to dig up crabs and things like that in the sediment. Like a, and, like a shovel kind of? Yeah, like a shovel and swallow these crabs and things. Um, 
and be able to crush them up with those teeth. But all the evidence we have is that they primarily eat, eat uh, fish. And, um, and so they whack the fish with that rostrum to stun them or kill them. And then they basically just swallow them whole after that. So the, the fish has to be able to fit down that mouth. Uh, the mouth is relatively large. I mean, for the size of the animal, it's not that big. But you know, for a, for a big adult that's say 12 feet long, uh, you know, the mouth will open up, um, you know, big enough that you could put a softball in it easily. Um, you know, probably two fists could fit in one, two adult fists. Um, so, um, yeah. Gotcha. So we have the teeth on the rostrum for whacking or maybe uh, stunning. And then um, some crushing flat uh, stingray uh, teeth, which we have on our website, Sharks for Kids. We have a lot of images for those interested in what that looks like. Um, and uh, yeah, and eating a lot of fish, not so much the invertebrates or, or like snails for crushing. Um, Tiffany, or excuse me, Teague was wondering, uh, what's the largest sawfish you've ever tagged? Yeah, the biggest, the, let's see, the biggest we've ever tagged, if I recall, was 465 centimeters. So that's right at about 15 and a half feet, something like that. Um, wow. There are reports that, um, yeah, that's the biggest female. The biggest male we've caught is was about a foot smaller than that. So the, the females, like in a lot of sharks and rays, the females are bigger than the males. Um, big as a truck. Uh, yeah, they, they, um, you know, there are reports that they can get up to 18 feet long or so, but uh, we've never seen that. I don't know anyone who's ever seen that with a small tooth sawfish. So, um, yeah, so I think that's about the biggest, uh, the biggest they get is about 15 and a half, 16 feet. That's great. Um, you mentioned one way um, that sawfish populations uh, are really declining is through some of the trawling, so maybe shrimp trawling or through using nets. Um, so I'm kind of curious, there's this device on shrimp boats called the turtle excluder device, also known as TED. Do you think mm -hmm. that is assisting in any way with larger animals like the sawfish? Yeah, it's a good question I, and, and the answer is no. We've actually talked with engineers about trying to, try to figure out a way to make a sawfish excluder device um, because we think a lot of the sawfish that get caught are actually behaving just like the sharks where they're actually following the shrimp boats around to eat the things that are thrown back overboard by the shrimp boats. The problem is that um, the rostrum gets tangled in the net before they ever get to the, to, to the TED often. And gotcha. so they're hung up in the net before they get to the turtle excluder device. And even if they did get to it, it's, it's possible that their rostrum would actually get hung in the tent itself. And, um, and so that's another issue. So we think the biggest way to eliminate um, mortality is they actually try to figure out when and where sawfish are most likely to encounter shrimp trawlers and just try to keep the trawlers from trawling those areas during those times. Um, and have the trawlers move elsewhere. Um, you know, gill nets are a big issue too. Probably the main reason we have sawfish left in the United States is because Florida banned gill nets in the 90s. And so since then, that probably was the main source of, of mortality on the juveniles was gill nets. And since the gill nets are, are now outlawed, that's allowed them to recover, we believe. It also doesn't hurt that we're, we're pretty lucky in that, I didn't mention this, but it's Bit fortunate that the, the main habitat for sawfish in Florida is all under some sort of protection. Now, the Charlotte Harbor, Caloosahatchee River is not so much, nor Cape Canaveral area, but um, most of the other nursery areas are in Everglades National Park or in the 10,000 Islands National Wildlife Refuge, so areas that are protected. Similarly, we think the main area for sawfish in the Bahamas is in the Andros West Side National Park, which is protected, although there are proposals to start developing that, which would be devastating, we think, to sawfish. So, uh, so having habitat protection and banning gill nets is probably one of the main reasons we have sawfish recovering now in, in, in the U.S. And so when you, meet, when you say protected, it's, it is mainly for that habitat, because those areas are still able to use for recreational fishing, for example, or, or snorkeling, like humans can still use these areas. 
That's right. Yeah, they can still fish and they do still catch sawfish. Um, and, and there's there's guidance for fishers on how to go about releasing a sawfish. Um, that was going to be my next question. How can I be a conscientious fisherman or fisherwoman? Yeah, and so there's, uh, for one, if you catch a sawfish, you want to, we want to know about it. And so there's a sawfish encounter database that's housed at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. You can go on that website. All you have to do is, is Google sawfish reporting and it'll take you right there. Report to them where you caught it, how big it was, what you were doing. There's no repercussions for, for catching it as long as you release it. We just want to know where and when they're caught and it helps us inform the management and inform the, um, you know, direct where we're going to do our research. That helps us a lot knowing where to do our research. Um, and then just release the animal as quickly as possible, cut the line as close to the, the mouth as you can without endangering the sawfish or yourself. You don't want to get too close to that rostrum, but we don't want a lot of line stringing out behind the sawfish that might get tangled up on its head or on its tail. Um, so you want to cut as much of that line off as possible, leave the hook in, um, don't try to get that out. And um, uh, yeah, and just uh, and just release the animal. Do not remove it from the water. You know, just just lift it just enough to get as close to the hook as possible and cut the line, and uh, and then let it go on its way. And if you if you remove one from the water and you take and there are photos of you with one from the water, you'll get a call from from somebody just telling instructing you that that's illegal. Don't do that. And um, and so we just want to make people aware of that. Great, thank you. I know from uh, myself, not only doing the sawfish reporting, um, but there's also uh, tons of people on different social media that'll even assist you further. So you just direct message any sawfish reporting handle on Instagram or Twitter. They get you in contact with the right people right away and it's, it's pretty easy. Um, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A, but to kind of finish, uh, since a lot of us aren't fortunate enough to live in, you know, South Florida or West Andrus. Um, how can we be a great advocate for sawfish? Um, what could we, what could we do? What can we, where, what can we learn or say? Well, I would say, you know, the biggest thing is to, is we need promotion of, of um, habitat preservation as well as um, strengthening the, the, uh, you know, protections such as the Endangered Species Act, for example. The Endangered Species Act is a, is a huge part of, of uh, preserving these really unusual animals that we have. I mean, if it wasn't for the Endangered Species Act, we probably not only wouldn't have American crocodiles, we probably wouldn't even have alligators because they were listed as threatened at one point. Those protections through the Endangered Species Act not only protect the animals themselves, but their habitat. And so, you know, um, uh, contacting your your um, you know Congress folks and telling them that you you want them to support the Endangered Species Act. There are groups that are trying to weaken the Endangered Species Act, and that are trying to weaken protections of our wetlands and our protections of coastal habitats. And so, um, those those things need to be protected. And so, uh, anything you can do uh, in any state to um, you know to uh, where you may may be to um, Make your, your, your elected representatives know that you are supportive of animal, animal uh, uh, protection as well as um, you know, animal uh, species preservation as well as habitat uh, protection is, is huge. Great. What a great message. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for all of that, for the talk, for the information, for the Q&A. I'm going to go ahead and hit stop on record.